Good morning and uh, welcome to our first Grand Rounds of the academic year. Uh, this is the time of year when we're uh, welcoming our visiting medical students and we're utilizing them for fantastic Grand Rounds presentations. Uh, it's always interesting to see uh, which one of the med students are really long-winded. It helps us to know whether we should have them present in the future. Uh, so we have three students uh, today, um, Nicholas Behannon, is that correct? I asked like 30 seconds ago, okay. Um, he's a fourth year medical student here at the University of Utah. Uh, the second presenter is uh, Scott Budikofer. I can pronounce his name because I've worked with him for the past two weeks. Uh, and then finally, um, Rachel Simpson, thank you for an easy name. Uh, University of Arizona will finish it off. Um, and if you need any assistance with AV stuff, um, we usually jump up and help you, so don't feel too bad, so uh, Nick. And the whole thing just turned off for a moment. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. There we go. All right. All right, thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, I'll be discussing advances in keratoconus treatment today. Uh, I'll start with a brief introduction to keratoconus and then jump right into the treatment. Um, we'll go mild, then moderate, then severe, and give a brief conclusion. So keratoconus is a progressive ectatic disorder of the cornea, uh, characterized by bilateral asymmetric non-inflammatory degeneration that results in central and paracentral thinning. and uh, myopia and irregular astigmatism. The disease usually presents in the teens or early 20s um, with irregular astigmatism, high myopia, and usually progresses until the 30s or early 40s when it stabilizes. The pathophysiology is unknown, but is it is associated with contact lens microtrauma, ATP, and eye rubbing. Um, I can't talk about keratoconus without mentioning family factors because this is my father, this is my son. My father, brother, and um, an aunt are all afflicted with keratoconus. And um, so growing up, there was a constant discussion about cornea transplantation and, and whatnot. So uh, there is a positive uh, family, family history present in 68% of cases. Uh, the hereditary pattern is not currently known, but the prevalence among first degree relatives is 15 to 67 times higher than the general population. So now let's jump into the treatments. First for mild keratoconus. The biggest problem in mild keratoconus <coughs> is the reduced visual acuity due to mild thinning in early disease. Uh, this uh, reduced visual acuity can be corrected initially with spectacles and soft contact lenses, um, but rigid gas permeable lenses are required to correct irregular astigmatism when it develops. And specialized, there are, there are many specialized um, fit methods for RGPs, and I wanted to talk about a couple of those. And um, Bill Cosby, at least if you believe the National Enquirer, has keratoconus. <laughs> um, the first um, method, RGP fit method, is called uh, piggyback, the piggyback method. This is involves the placement of a soft contact lens on the on the, the cornea with an additional RGP lens pl placed anteriorly, as shown in the image. Another method is a hybrid lens, which consists of a central rigid gas permeable lens with a peripheral soft contact skirt. Uh, this provides greater comfort, but continues to have the problem of limited oxygen permeability. For highly irregular corneas, it's difficult to achieve a proper fit, and that results in a frequent RGP loss. Uh, a last resort for contact use is the scleral contact lens consisting of a central optic vault, uh, or a central optic which vaults over the cone from limbus to limbus, uh, which allows tear film to collect and, and uh, correct for the irregular uh, pattern of the cornea. Uh, it also has a flat periphery which lies out over the sclera. These contacts are obviously very large, difficult to fit, and difficult to wear, and they're also very expensive. 
Let's move to moderate keratoconus. Um, moderate keratoconus is difficult to treat, and this is an area where there's a lot of advancement in, in treatment modalities. The, the difficulty arises from the fact that best corrective visual acuity is worse than 2020, but there's only mild corneal thinning and no scar, so it makes it difficult to justify corneal transplantation. And uh, Steve Holcomb, an Olympic bobsledder, uh, benefited from one of these uh, treatments I'll talk about today. Um, when, when approaching moderate keratoconus, it's important to recognize the critical disease aspects. These, these three aspects of the disease are important to address with any treatment, uh, treatment options that you pursue. First is irregular astigmatism and manifest cylinder, the rate of ectatic progression, and the degree of myopia. So the first treatment I'd like to discuss is collagen cross-linking. This involves the formation of covalent bonds between the collagen molecules, um, increasing the strength of the collagen scaffold and creating greater corneal stiffness. The collagen cross-linking procedure involves epithelial debridement, initially to, to uh, maximize the absorption of UVA light, which, which occurs in the anterior 200 to 300 micrometers of the cornea. Riboflavin drops are then administered, followed by the UVA light exposure um, in that range of th that's mentioned there. Studies show that high energy, short duration um, treatments are promising on the order of the, the 30 milliwatts per centimeter squared for three minutes. Multiple studies show that disease progression can be slowed and even stopped with corneal collagen cross-linking. There is minimal improvement in the prescription and long-term results and safety are not yet well established and therefore the, the FDA approval is still pending, but will likely, likely come here in the next couple of years. The next treatment is intracorneal, intrastromal corneal ring segments. These are C-shaped polymethyl methacrylate rings that are implanted in the deep corneal stroma. They provide sp uh, spacer elements between lamellar bundles, shorten the arc length and flatten the central cornea. Um, they reduce manifest <coughs> cylinder and irregular astigmatism. And uh, there's some controversy that exists over whether they really provide any uh, slowing of the disease progression. A specific, uh, specific ICRS for keratoconus is the Intex severe keratoconus. It has a larger diameter and therefore can be implanted closer to the, to the visual axis. Reports show up to 12 diopters of corneal flattening, uh, which allows for improved corrected distant visual acuity um, contact tolerance, other treatment options. It's not yet available in the United States, but it's, uh, it's a promising treatment. Uh, next, we have photorefractive keratectomy after penetrating keratoplasty. PRK uses an eczema laser uh, photoablation to remodel the anterior central cornea and allow for better vision. The problems are that it only corrects regular astigmatism, so if the donor cornea has irregular astigmatism, um, it doesn't, it's not really useful. It's also difficult to predict refractive outcome and uh, the host cornea, the underlying problem, the host cornea still has some keratoconus and uh, there are varying degrees of wound healing and whenever you deal with a corneal transplant, there it's important to remember that iatrogenic ectasias after PKP are, have been reported. Customized aferic uh, topography guided PRK uh, shows promise um, elsewhere in the world. It's not yet in the United States. The next treatment option is phacic intraocular lenses. Uh, these have the advantage of being independent of the cornea. They're predictable, safe, and can correct large amounts of myopia. Um, but they have no effect on the cylinder and no effect on the disease progression. Uh, newer, newer brands, newer advances in, in the intraocular lens are the toric iris claw and artiflex lenses, which correct both myopia and cylinder. They're available in Europe currently. And again, they still do not slow the progression of the disease. So considering the, the, the three critical disease aspects that we discussed earlier, each, each of the treatment modalities we've discussed addresses one or more of, of these factors. And so the, the really next logical step in the progression is the combination of these therapies in order to achieve uh, the best treatment possible. And there have been many reports of successful combination therapies with these treatments. Now we'll move to severe keratoconus. Uh, severe keratoconus is characterized by severe corneal thinning. 
with steepening greater than 55 diopters. Corneal scarring is present, and um, visual acuity cannot be corrected greater than 20-25 with, with the RGP lenses. Surgery is really considered when contact lenses fail. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie um, Princess Bride, but uh, the classic. And the, the actor who played Inigo Montoya um, benefited from one of these uh, treatments that we'll talk about. So penetrating keratoplasty is st still the standard of care. Involves the removal of the central seven to nine millimeters of the, of the affected cornea, which is then replaced with donor corneal tissue. PKP provides a clear cornea and has good graft survival uh, with reports of 98.8% at 10 years and an average survival of 17.3 years. Um, problems persist afterward with irregular astigmatism with visual rehab being accomplished through stitch removal, spectacle use, and RGP lenses. Advances in corneal transplantation include deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, the DALK. Uh, this involves removal of the central corneal stroma without compromising the corneal endothelium or Dezina's membrane. Uh, it has a lot of advantages. Obviously, it keeps the, the globe closed and reduces the risks associated with that. It also leaves the endothelial layer undisturbed and therefore uh, ha reduces the risk of endothelial rejection. So, th th and that would be important, especially in younger patients who have to live with their graft for a long time. Um, graft survival has been modeled uh, with computer models and uh, the average predicted lifespan of a graft is 49 years, which is a, an improvement over the established 17.3 with uh, PKP. The, the outcomes are comparable, and there is the improved visual rehab associated with it. The disadvantage, the big disadvantage of DALK, is that it's a difficult surgery to perform, especially the stuff that involves big bubble separation of, of Desilene's membrane from the corneal stroma. Um, there are a lot of techniques reported in the literature, but none have simplified the process such that it mainstream adaptation um, can happen. I think that once that once uh, it, the procedure is simplified, that it will be adopted in the mainstream. Um, the next advancement I'd like to talk about is intralaced enabled keratoplasty. This involves femtosecond laser uh, use to create um, vari variations in wound configuration, as shown on, on this side of the slide. Uh, these, these different configurations provide greater surface area for healing in the, corne in the corneal graft and the greater surface area means faster wound healing and earlier suture removal. Comparing IEK with DALK, um, the best spectacle corrected visual acuity and complication rates are very similar, but IEK produces a better visual recovery, but at a significant cost increase. And DALK has been associated with less astigmatism and higher order aberration. So the question is, is, is IEK worth the money? So conclusions that, uh, that I draw from, from my study of keratoconus. First, there have been many advances in the past decade. Um, collagen cross-linking is the most promising, in my opinion, as it theoretically provides the possibility of stopping progression in that early stage um, and then hopefully maintaining that, that halt or arresting progression until, until the uh, progression of the disease is, is passed. Combination therapies are available for later stages, which provide a greater scope of treatment. And despite the advances in corneal transplantation, PKP remains uh, the standard of care. And there's my bibliography. Um, thank you for your attention.
Contact lens microtrauma, ATP, and eye rubbing. Um, some interesting studies involving uh, patients with Down syndrome who have a predilection for eye rubbing, rigorous eye rubbing, um, and an increased rate of keratoconus among those particular patients. So, yeah, well, I think there's some uh, uh, incredible pedigree in which uh, uh, genetics would be the same, but the only one in, in, in which you get keratoconus is those who certainly have uh, uh, albumin and other uh, bone growth problems, bone growth defects. So, uh, if you think about it, you know, when you rub your eye really well and you kind of get that little circle of that pedigree, the reason you're immunized is that there's uh, if you block something in an artery, then that's the blood flow and it's more likely to be in the eye. So, you know, you rub your eye vigorously, you can raise the pressure in that four or five hundred degree region. You know you have a good chance of raising it. If you can imagine your ear doing that, and that's the, the whole idea of it, so it's all fluid. Well, it's something unusual for these two people with the mullet and starting to sort of move on each other. They're not, they're not holding together well, and so it's all kind of interfered. So, yeah, rubbing the eye. And so if you see some of the